Good evening there, everybody. Uh, welcome to the inaugural webinar uh, that we are now going to be planning on doing on a monthly basis. Uh, we certainly uh, welcome your uh, interaction. We welcome your joining us. Uh, you have, uh, as an attendee, uh, the on your control panel, the option that you should have something that says questions. And as we go through the, the topic this evening, uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to encourage you to type in the question. Uh, there will be an opportunity at the end of, of my presentation to try and answer whatever questions that you have. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, answer all the questions that come in, but don't necessarily wait until the very end to try and type it in. You may actually forget what your question was at that point. So we encourage you to uh, use the, uh, the the area called questions uh, to ask your information. At the end of this uh, particular uh, presentation and moving forward, uh, we're going to be asking asking for your feedback. Uh, how do we make this more for what you need it to be? Uh, this is going to be an educational series. Uh, we have uh, lots of educational opportunities. Uh, these webinars are, are going to be that particular opportunity to share the topics that you're interested in, uh, share the aspects of, for some of you, uh, hopefully if not all of you, uh, the aspect of looking at uh, how the uh, biological medicine and bioregulatory medicine will basically approach uh, everyday common type problems that uh, people in our in in and about your personal uh, circle uh, will experience. So uh, that's it. Uh, my name is Dick Tom. For those of you who don't know me, I, uh, as you see from my degrees, I practiced dentistry for the 16 years of my career, and for the last 30 plus years, I've practiced as a naturopath. Uh, I'm now presently in Scottsdale, Arizona at the American Center for Biological Medicine. And at the end of this, I'll give you a little bit more information about that. So we obviously have the potential of talking about uh, many, many different um, you know, areas. Uh, because fatigue is such a common problem, and in fact, it's next to pain, maybe they're equal. Uh, virtually all patients who uh, make an appointment to see a physician about something or other, invariably one of those two problems come into the mix. Not necessarily chronic fatigue, uh, although chronic fatigue has been around, as we'll see, for a very long time. Uh, sometimes now, and there's a huge overlap, as we'll see, in a number of different types of conditions that people will present with who have chronic fatigue. So also known as CFIDS, uh, chronic fatigue immune deficiency syndrome, is that is that what that uh, is is um, stands for? So as I just said, fatigue is among the most common complaints where uh, patients, uh, you know, go to see a doctor. But it's not the fatigue uh, that is the real problem. It's the reason why do you have the fatigue? And I would say that's what is uh, often what differentiates bioregulatory, biological medicine uh, from uh, many other types of approaches. So because there's many standard things, and of course the most common reason that people think they have fatigue is because their thyroid doesn't work efficiently. And yes, that is one of dozens, if not hundreds of reasons, uh, why fatigue is, is a common reason why people see it. However, even if, you, if, even if it is your thyroid, I'm gonna tell you that's not the problem either. Because then the question is, well, if your thyroid is sluggish, why is your thyroid sluggish? Then we have to keep, so we keep the investigation going until we get to truly what the root is. Uh, as, it, as it suggests here, chronic fatigue is often misdiagnosed, and as a result of that, it's often mistreated. Um, and the incorrect diagnosis and the incorrect management potentially can lead you down a rabbit hole that you don't want to go down because it doesn't really get you where it is that you need to get to. So the uh, CDC uh, has published this, this uh, specific um, definition of what is, if somebody has chronic fatigue, what are they, you know, what, what are they talking about? <clears throat> so this is with the discussion with a practitioner, you know, unexplained, a persisting or relapsing fatigue. I know lots of people are tired, but they say, I just ran a marathon. I'm tired. Okay, well, it's pretty obvious. I just had the flu. I haven't recovered yet. Okay, it's obvious. 
but this is new and relapsing. Um, it it uh, has at some point the definite uh, onset or can have a definite onset. It is not the result, however, of specific exertion, and it's not relieved because a person is able to sleep 18 hours one night and sort of catch up because of of uh, you know that particular component of things. So it's this ongoing. We don't really know what's going on, but in addition to that, it's a whole host. It's a whole variety of uh, involving multiple different organ systems. And if we lined up 20 people with so-called chronic fatigue, they ne they wouldn't necessarily all have the same presentation. It's a, it's, you know, we're suggesting that you have this unrelenting onset of fatigue, but plus four or more of the, of the following. And as you'll see, as we go over this list, you're gonna, a lot of people will say, I have that, I have that, I have that. Do I have chronic fatigue? And you may, without even realizing it, but you haven't reached the point where you say, well, I can't get out of bed anymore. So the four more, and then once again, this is by the, uh, the uh, CDC. So self-reported uh, memory and concentration. And I have to say that a credible number of patients who come to us in our office, that is a common problem. The ability to focus or stay focused, uh, the ability to, you know, my memory isn't as good. And unfortunately, because Alzheimer's is now well known out there in the general public, uh, it's it's very common and very typical that people think that if they, you know, for, are forgetting something or they're not as sharp as they used to be, and they say, oh, is this just aging? Oh, my gosh, my grandma or my uh, a sibling or, a, you know, a parent had, you know, is now uh, been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Is that what I'm getting? So we're not at that level, obviously, but this is a common uh, type of a, a symptom that they uh, will present with. Uh, the cervical nodes are up here in the, you know, in the area, and they, you know, you may feel around, and of course, your lymph nodes, your lymphatic system, as we'll see, covers your entire body, but here they're near the surface, and you know, if you've had a sore throat before, or uh, you know, you'll feel them, or if, if you have children or grandchildren. You know, when you when you poke around, you can feel these these little lumps and bumps. And they're part of our immune system, uh, and they are often swollen. Uh, the very commonly, uh, these people uh, will wake up in the morning and every morning, and they say, "My throat is sore," but yet they're they don't have a fever, they just don't feel well, they're tired, they're not rested, and they have a sore throat. And usually, as the day goes on, uh, it gets that sore throat. Either they forget about it, or somehow it gets better. Uh, varying types of muscle pain, uh, multiple joint pain, but it's not like this rheumatoid arthritis where the joint is, is all swollen up and red and hot and twice as big as the next joint. It's just they're, they're, they're sore uh, all over and said, I don't know why they're sore. Uh, headaches that uh, are varying severity. Uh, of course, one of the keynotes of this is that no matter how much you sleep, it's, you're, you're still tired. It's still a very unrefreshing. And then if you do do some form of activity, you has it have this uh, post-exertional malaise that, you know, you go to the, you thought you go to the gym, you go to the gym because you want to feel better, but then you do relatively not necessarily over vigorous activity. Uh, but then it, 24 hours later, it feels like you just went to the gym. So the fatigue, common thing, and then some combination of four or more, if not even more, uh, symptoms than that, <clears throat> and and the you know eventually it got lumped into this whole idea uh, with this because of the muscle pain and the fatigue, fibromyalgia. So we often put fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, in the same sentence. So this is this the 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 symptoms, however, are not uh, a mental issue. So it's not people who have psychosis and are just sort of thinking that this is what's going on. And it's not people who are abusing uh, alcohol or uh, any type of illegal medication prescription or otherwise. But it does, as you as we see, it does include fibromyalgia and it definitely does include uh, anxiety and panic. And you know, so in addition to the four of the above, we also have these and from that picture, you see you know, headaches, sleep disorders, dizziness, cognitive memory, anxiety, depression, uh, fatigue, twitches, uh, urinary, urinary problems, uh, nausea, morning stiffness, uh, dysmenorrhea for women, 
uh, and it goes on and on. You know, vision problems, eye problems. Uh, it's almost like it's a laundry list. And, you know, since I started uh, practicing medicine way back in the 1970s, you know, in those days, uh, we didn't call it uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. In those days, it was listed as hypoglycemia, uh, where oh, we thought it was a blood sugar dysregulation. And you could have literally a very varied list of symptoms similar to that. And then if you're around in the 80s, uh, we started calling it uh, candida. Uh, the Yeast Connection by William Crook uh, was published, and if anybody had ever taken a birth control pill or anybody had ever taken an antibiotic, it was now, oh my God, you have intestinal candida uh, th that's based overrunning your immune system, and now you have all these this incredible variety of, of symptoms as are listed that we've just been discussing. And then as time went on, because at this point, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue were still considered, as we'll see, a not, a not a condition. And the reason it was considered made up is because, as we'll see, there's no specific lab test. There's no real specific, you know, uh, blood test you can do that says, oh, this is what happens when you have chronic fatigue. Uh, because for the most part, they are all fine. So there was the assumption by doctors that people just made this thing up. Uh, but as we'll see, that's not indeed true. And of course, then we get into the 2000s. Now fibromyalgia as a, as a diagnosis is accepted. Now chronic fatigue as a diagnosis is accepted. But now we start to see other things creeping into this. And what's creeping into this in the last 10, 15 years ago, of course, is Lyme disease, chronic Lyme disease, uh, recurrent Lyme disease. And it's like, whoa, this sounds like some of the things I've just said. Oh, is this, do they have Lyme disease or do they have chronic fatigue? And they say, well, we have a test for Lyme, but the tests are not particularly great to potentially diagnose it. So we said, well, you have the signs and symptoms in the presentation. So we think you have Lyme disease uh, for what's going on. It, but it's literally, if you read all the symptoms you get with blood sugar, you read all the symptoms that you can get with yeast connection, you read all the signs and symptoms you can get with fibromyalgia, you read all the symptoms you can get with chronic fatigue, you read all the symptoms you can get with Lyme disease, and you say, Wow, there's a big overlap here. Are we talking about one thing? We're we talking about multiple different conditions. So, you know, that's why we technically say we don't treat diseases, we treat people. Uh, we treat people who come in with a variety of different concerns, challenges, and we're not looking at for the name of a condition. We're looking at how did the body get here in order to, you know, uh, need the services of a physician. So, we see that there's a huge overlap. Uh, you know, with, so we see fatigue, which, as I said earlier, uh, is for the most part an aspect of, you know, almost any reason that any reason the person goes to a doctor, fatigue is uh, is a is a pretty common presentation. And then we see in the sort of the smaller circle is this idea of chronic fatigue, and then part of that is this idiopathic chronic fatigue, and then we have these overlapping disorders of depression, fibromyalgia, and it's like. Do we have, are we depressed because we don't feel well or we, do we have uh, fatigue because we have depression? So, you know, which way did it go? Is it the chicken or the egg? So our goal is to try and sort, you know, some of this stuff out. So a minute ago I said uh, the aspects of what the definition from uh, the CDC says. So this is the National Institute of Health uh, for, for, you know, for all excellence, for the guidelines. And this was published uh, a little over 10 years ago. Just as I said, new onset, specific, persistent, recurrent, unexplained by other things, uh, results in reduction of your activity level. Uh, and people who have it feel just as that, that one woman does in the picture. It's like, wow, I really don't feel uh, very well at all in general. And we have this uh, post-exertional uh, fatigue. <clears throat> now, we said that the uh, CDC says you needed four or more of these things. And, you know, that picture is of Nice, France. And anybody who has what we're talking about, I'm sure would much rather be in Nice, France than having to deal with a definition from Nice, where they're saying it's only one or more, you know, one or more of these, not four or more. And for all intents and purposes, fatigue with sleep problems, fatigue with myalgia, fatigue with a headache, Fatigue with swollen lymph nodes, fatigue with a sore throat, fatigue with brain fog, fatigue with flu-like symptoms, fatigue with nausea, 
fatigue with the heart palpitations said, holy crumb, who isn't that? I mean, what person doesn't have one of those and say, I'm fatigued? But you have to go back to, and I'll go back a slide. The key is, is that you, it's not the fatigue that you have a demonstrable reason for. That's what's differentiating it. But we see that there's a, there's a certainly an overlap of the types of uh, problems that people are having. And, uh, you know, as that slide suggests, it's like our brain doesn't work. Uh, and, you know, and it's like you don't necessarily have to be all the way to chronic fatigue syndrome to say my brain doesn't work or my brain fog. Because uh, next month, when we will talk about that at the end, when we start talking about one of the reasons, another reason that people have brain fog, in fact, a very common reason uh, in this particular condition, uh, what we end up seeing is uh, that short term memory. They read something, they have to read the, the, a book, they read the same page six times, and they still don't remember what they read. read. Um, they're even unable to uh, concentrate on watching a television program, even it doesn't really involve a lot of brain power. Uh, this, <coughs> so the, the everything about sort of their cognitive aspects, uh, you know, and when we get to, gee, putting your washing in the refrigerator said, well, it's almost like an Alzheimer's piece. But you don't have to have Alzheimer's to get to this point where it's as if your brain is out of order. Uh, so we have to be mindful of that. <clears throat> That sleep is such, such a huge problem uh, in our society. Uh, and is it, you know, has it got worse in the, in the five decades that I've been a doctor? My experience is either people talk about it a whole lot more, uh, but I think it is a lot worse. It's a lot more prevalent in people. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, our environment now. A lot has to do with social media. People carry around cell phones now. People are around carry around portable uh, laptops. So they take it to bed, they take their iPad to bed, they're constantly again being bombarded by the, the uh, electromagnetic radiation coming off these screens or the Wi-Fi that basically is running your cell phone or your iPad and that type of thing. So these people will often, even though they're absolutely exhausted, uh, <coughs> will often complain that they can't get to sleep. Even though they're so exhausted, like they're dead tired and so oh, I'm really going to sleep well tonight. They go there and like that picture shows, they just lie there and they just and they can't shut their brain off. And when they do get to sleep, they may sleep 15 hours and wake up and said, oh, my God, did I even go to sleep last night? So totally unrefreshing. Um, and we only get refreshing sleep when we get into the different stages of sleep, which I'm, is not part I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to call, excuse me. <clears throat> is that they don't get into the proper, they don't get into REM sleep, their hormones are out of balance, now their growth hormone doesn't come up, their cortisol level doesn't go down, their melatonin is out of balance. So all these things that are supposed to be happening during our sleep doesn't happen. And the reason it's unrefreshing is because they really are not going through the, the four phases of, of the sleep cycle that that is what normally allows us to be refreshed. But once again, we also have this hormone piece uh, that we need to be looking at. Uh, myalgia and arthralgias. Uh, we know if any of you listening, and I suspect some of you are. <coughs> I'm going to have to find something for this cough. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, the aspect of I'm stiff, I'm sore. And if you have fibromyalgia and have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, part of this syndrome, you know that you have 11 of 17 trigger points that are in different parts of the body uh, that basically when you touch are incredibly tender. So a physician may have done those and says, yes, you have more than more than 11 points, uh, trigger points. So we'll diagnose you with a fibromyalgia. However, you don't have to have the, all those trigger points, but generally you get up in the morning and say, oh, I'm so stiff. I can't move. I have to get in a hot shower sort of to get me moving around or arthralgia or the joints themselves that are stiff and sore. But once again, they're not swollen, they're not red. You touch them and say, oh, that doesn't feel very good. So we know that there's some form of um, irritation, uh, but no objective sign that there's actually an inflammation, which is the redness, the swelling, heat, et cetera. And it's very general, and it can be very generalized. It could be the neck, which is very common, 
Uh, it could be the abdomen. It could be the low back. It could be the knee. It could be the ankle. It could be the shin. It can be anywhere in, in the body. And, you know, somebody will often take a pain medication, Tylenol, Advil, leave, whatever, over the counter and has said, I don't really do anything. Uh, these people may often have gone to pain clinics and have been trying a variety of things, and that's not working either. So they live in this very uncomfortable uh, scenario and situation. And this problem affects more people than we'd like to uh, think about. <laughs> So in 2015, the CDC said there's upwards of two and a half million people. Now, this is the actual, by their definition, the number of people. But I can tell you it's there's in the 50 to 100 million people who have some variety of these types of things. So let's not wait till, you know, you have to have a so-called diagnosis of this to basically start some form of intervention. You see, there's billions and billions of dollars that are put into this uh, problem. There's billions of dollars of lost wages because people are unable to carry on their occupation. It is more common in women, it is more common in the white, uh, in the white uh, Caucasian race, but it occurs in all parts of the world and it does occur in all races and all socioeconomic groups. Uh, it is a huge strain uh, on uh, an individual, on an individual's family. And we always think of this as, as I just said, it's like it's sort of new, it wasn't recognized as a Western diagnosis technically until the 1990s, but it's been around forever, 1869. So at, those point, at that point, they just called it neurasthenia or so-called nervous exhaustion. And in fact, in the 1800s, this is one of the most prevalent things that got diagnosed, which is like, wow. So the 1800s had the same type problems we did. So let's not blame this on you know, our present day society. It was going on back then too which makes us believe uh, that people were not following the so-called natural laws, which is, which is a presentation I'm gonna be doing in uh, Cape Cod and in Providence uh, coming up in a few weeks for those of you in the East Coast. Uh, so, you know, one of the, and the, the originators of uh, occupational therapy, uh, you know, is treated uh, this type of problem. So OT has been around for, you know, decades. So. The, then by the early 1900s, they, you know, people would have this fatigue and then they started saying, oh, you know, maybe they're just depressed or maybe it's some other a psychiatric problem. So here's a variety of different names that it became known as, but it's all still the same thing. Once again, back to 1869 as neurasthenia. In the 1950s, they called it myalgic encephalomyelitis. And then it was chronic Epstein-Barr, which we still still a very prevalent uh, issue in the 80s, uh, became the yuppie flu. Uh, then we had the CDC definition that I talked about in uh, 1994, and then the Royal College in 96 came up. The Chief Medical Officer report reported some things, and the one I just showed you, the Nice one in 2007, uh, 2011, and then 2000. So, you know, we've kind of given an update from these things, but the reality is no different than what it was in 1869. And so when we tend to think of medicine, you know, conditions nowadays, and we blame stress, uh, we blame what's happening in society, we blame social media, uh, you know, the, the march in Washington last weekend, it's like, you know, how was that part of that? How was that affecting kids? But, you know, none of that was going on in the 1800s, but yet this, this very similar problem uh, was going on. So... There's too many names. And so it doesn't matter what the name is. And that's why we don't worry about the name. I don't treat names. I treat people who have uh, the, uh, specific types of issues. I think it is important, though, that you understand that there's these three P's of sort of that are sort of come into play that are at least a component of uh, what's going on here. The first is, you know, are there predisposing factors? <clears throat> so we have to so we have to look at these as if this was true in 1899, you have to look at predisposing factors that were happening potentially in the 1800s as much as they are in 2018. We know genetics has been here forever. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, over the 200, 500,000 years that man has been on this planet, there's a genetic aspect and, and the genetic pool has changed. Uh, some of you may have recently seen uh, the astronaut, uh, gosh, I forget his name at the moment, um, 
there will be uh, an aspect of he was in space for a year. It's he's married to um, the the senator, or the congresswoman who was shot here in Tucson, gosh, I, and his twin brother. And they now found that even because he was in space, then they were and for a year, they've actually a twin brothers identical DNA before they before he was they went to space. He came back from space, and eight percent of his DNA has changed from being in space. It was always boy. This is totally new as a doctor. They said genes don't change. We know that with epigenetics, they don't divide the same, but now we know we can actually change the genes. Now we're not all going to fly into space to change our genes, but you know, the way medicine is, it's like, oh yeah, we're just gonna find the gene problem and we'll just, you know, we'll plug in a new gene and you're gonna be cured. That ain't gonna work, and we're not all going to space, at least not yet, in order to change our genes. But there is a genetic component associated with this. We know that there are a variety of precipitating events. Uh, obviously, in 1889, it wasn't vaccines, uh, although the first smallpox vaccine was 1796. Uh, so, I mean, there were, and uh, Pasteur was around in those days, and but, you know, it didn't become common until certainly well into the 50s. We know that infection was very prevalent. We know stress was very prevalent. We know toxicity was very prevalent, and we know life events were very prevalent. So the same precipitating events in, in 1800s are the same precipitating events as they are in 2018. And then what are the things that basically perpetuate and why, you know, why is it that people think I'll never get over this? I can't get over this. <clears throat> well, I don't think there were lawyers in the day. So, you know, I don't know how they settled discriminate. I mean, happens they went and, you know, basically they shot at each other. Uh, but, you know, your beliefs about illness, we know that there's so much information now about what we believe we can manifest. And if you believe you can't get better, it's probably true you can't. Uh, if you believe you can get better with some support, there's a higher likelihood. There's not a guarantee, there's just a higher likelihood that you will. Um, you know, we, we obviously are more interested in trying to understand the cause of these things. And we know that perpetuating that is some people say, well, I'm so tired, but I got to get moving. So this perpetuation of extremes of activity. <clears throat> so what are some of the, you know, the, the possible causes as, as we are just mentioning? Uh, <clears throat> genetic defects. Uh, we now know that there's so-called, uh, there's been identified what are called SNPs, which are little pieces of the gene that are not uh, perfectly aligned. So we say, well, that's the problem, that's the reason. Those have been around forever also. Those are not, nothing we're gonna talk about is new. Infectious agents have been here since the world began. Uh, bacteria, viruses, and fungi have been here since, you know, in the four plus billion years that the earth has been in existence. There is a connection between this uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, and that's gonna be the focus of our topic in a month from now when we uh, do this webinar again. Uh, over time. There is what we call this orthostatic uh, intolerance. Perhaps it's uh, neurally medi mediated through our nervous system. And then the profound psychological stress is potentially, and then of course the aspect of nutritional deficiencies. So, you know, this is just a, this is just a couple of studies that are that have been done in the arena of genetics. So my my whole thing with genetics is not to blame genes because more important than the genes, uh, you know, if you didn't pick your great grandparents, grandparents and parents well, you didn't choose those well, you know, you got stuck with the genes you got. So it's like, we're stuck. But however, what we so much have learned in the last uh, 10 years is that we have the ability to alter how the gene divides and what it becomes. And so you could take identical twins just like this, the space one that I just mentioned, uh, perfect, the genes are identical. I mean, they were made, the, you know, the when the, the two uh, separated, we have a perfect set of chromosomes, perfect set of genes, uh, The but you put them in two different environments and two different sets of things emerge. So now we know it's not just about the genes. And in fact, if you believe it's all genetics, take that out of your mind because it's more about epigenetics. And the beauty of epigenetics is we have the ability um, uh, to change how those genes divide. And yes, the, the somebody just posted, Mike and Scott Kelly. 
uh, are the two people involved in who just recently came out with the fact that the genes have changed by 8% by going into space. Uh, so we have that aspect of things. Uh, unfortunately, we have a, a zillion uh, viruses that are more often involved. As you see, bacterial infections are usually not a uh, component as far as causing this particular problem. Uh, most people listening, in fact, if not everybody listening this evening, uh, will have been exposed probably to at least one of those. Uh, EBV being the most common. It's a very common Epstein-Barr virus. It's, it's, uh, some of you have probably read Medical Medium. The assumption is that's the cause of everything, and nothing is the cause of everything. It's a contributor probably to uh, some specific uh, issue. So we need to pay attention to that, and it's not the infection that's the problem. It's why does your body not able to keep it in check, or why did your body get into a state that if you were exposed to these things, and whether it's hepatitis or West Nile virus or influenza, the recent flu, et cetera, it's like what's going on within your own uh, immune system. Uh, this HPA axis has to do with, you know, the feedback loop. Uh, well, let's say we're not going to talk about it extensively tonight, which is, uh, you know, cortisol that is being produced by an endocrine system, but it is an important piece of this bigger picture that we're looking at. Uh, orthostatic intolerance is an autonomic nervous system dysfunction. Uh, and so one of the tests, as you see, this person is all hooked up to this table, this tilt table. And so, you know, they lie you, they lie you down and they're able to make all these measurements. Uh, you know, the, the idea is that somehow that there's something going up here in the brain that somehow is, is mal aligned, we'll say. Uh, so, but no consistent response to that. Uh, it's very common that there's a coexisting mental conditions or mental uh, challenges. <coughs> As I said, depression and anxiety are pretty common uh, in this particular group of people. Uh, and it's not that, oh, there's something terribly wrong with me. I have this depression. I mean, the reality is if anybody's in chronic pain, for, or even if you have chronic itching, which in some cases is worse than pain for whatever type thing, if anybody's had that, I can tell you from what my, my clientele report to me, many people would say, I would rather be in chronic pain and then have chronic itching. It is incredibly uncomfortable, and it literally drives people to do things that they would not otherwise uh, wish to do or be able to do. Uh, you know, we look at uh, one third of people who have this are on depressants at the time of their assessment. One third have been on antidepressants, and they say, well, of course, they didn't do anything. Uh, and then the other one third uh, haven't been. It's not really the, uh, the approach that's, that's going to be the answer. Uh, mental, emotional. Uh, you know, from our perspective, do we really doesn't really matter whether it's from a physical or psychological, because it's not really going to affect what it is that ultimately we're going to try and do for these people. So, how do we diagnose uh, this particular uh, type of condition or uh, become familiar? Uh, the uh, the aspect of you know these are the types of things that we typically see. History is you know very often what I've already reported. The so-called characteristic exam is, I didn't find anything. Uh, and the characteristic lab tests are, I didn't find anything. So you, know, you call them characteristics. Uh, you know, is it a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning it's not something else? For the most part, that's kind of where we have to start. It doesn't, because, uh, you know, there's, it's, there's an interesting uh, challenge that's going to come with this one. Um, <clears throat> it is important. Uh, to consider other types of things that cause fatigue, but you you know if we use the strict definition that we basically started with, the the we're looking for the characteristic of the uh, CFIDs or the uh, CFS. Uh, the history of the person is is really what is the most important thing, and not just that I'm tired, but tell me about it, and you know all the things that I basically have talked about. <clears throat> so we have this sudden onset uh, after resolution or whatever. They, they really don't feel that they ever get back to their original baseline. And we know that physical activity will exacerbate uh, the symptoms themselves. We've gone over the, these are the typical symptoms. Uh, and unfortunately, the, whatever the group of the particular group of symptoms that the individual has, it does inhibit their day-to-day -day activity. Uh, they, you know, like that lady in the picture shows, he says, you know, you start to do a task and it's like partway through, I said, oh, I'm just so exhausted. I'm so tired. I have a headache. My back hurts, etc. I can't focus. I'm not able to do that. 
physical exam, for the most part, uh, doesn't find anything very abnormal. In fact, it's not. It's normal physiology, and that's why, you know, through this through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and even though it's been going on for 100 years before that. They didn't call it anything because they didn't think they thought it was totally psychological and you just were making it up. You may have some lymph nodes, but they're really not that significant uh, for what's underlying that. And they always say, well, there's no test. We, there's no there's no sense doing a blood test because we're not going to find anything that's unique to this specific uh, type of a problem. However, that said, uh, you see, Nice rec does recommend that we do do some testing, uh, a urine test. Uh, a CBC, which is a full blood count, and then a metabolic panel, which includes your thyroid and your minerals and your kidney function, and perhaps we should check people for gluten because it's more common than people realize. And, you know, if there are specific types of things, uh, you know, you should do those. And then they generally say, you don't bother doing these because they're really not going to be that helpful or that effective. Now, the challenge with that is we're trying to rule out that it's not something else. In order to rule out, as it said, if you don't do them, you can't exclude the other conditions. You know, what if a person is, is simply has a low ferritin? And, and since it's not a recommended test, and the reason is the people who have the condition will have normal ferritin, not optimal, but normal. Uh, so we get into that type of a scenario. So, you know, from a biological medicine, bioregulatory medicine perspective, we have to be realistic. And it's not we order every test you can order. We also have to be mindful that there are other conditions that this huge overlap. Is it Lyme disease? Uh, is it is it uh, intestinal candida? Is it a blood sugar issue? Is it a cortisol issue? Is it a thyroid issue? Because all these come into play uh, when we're looking at the big picture. So, you know, what the, basically it says, we need to exclude other things uh, from, you know, what the particular problem is. And unfortunately, when you start doing that, uh, this process can can take uh, quite a while uh, to eventually arrive at at uh, what you know one needs to do. However, that said, when we get to the end of this and I start talking about sort of what our approach to this, we don't necessarily say we have to we have to come up with you know the definitive answer uh, to what's going on uh, because we're going to start with natural laws and we're going to start the types of things that we know are going to have to be part of this uh, process. <clears throat> Now these are just another, these are other types of things that one usually considers as a you know your doctor will consider whether it's a, a once again a chronic um, viral infection of some type. Fortunately, cancer can certainly lead to this. There are a number of uh, neurological type things that a neurologist would see people for uh, the simple aspect of nutrient deficiencies. And I don't have the statistic in front of me, but it's some it's over seventy five percent of the US population is deficient in at least one nutrient. And believe it or not, one nutrient can make the difference. So, you know, looking at the nutritional status of somebody is 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 reality. And just because somebody eats enough calories, which is usually not a problem in our in the United States and Canada, uh, it certainly can be an issue uh, getting enough nutrition, which is very different than calories uh, for, for what's happening uh, for people in general. So the endocrine problem, and I say we'll talk about that extensively in a month from now. Uh, we have to at least be mindful that there are potentially underlying mental uh, mental health uh, issues. Autoimmune disease, very very common uh, overlap uh, with many of the things we've already talked about. And then there's things like sleep apnea that you know usually it takes a polysomography uh, to be able to fully diagnose that. But uh, drugs will do it. Alcohol will do it. And then the iatrogenic medications is a very common a type of issue. So, you know, all that said is, oh, my God, what, what if we have this? There's nothing we can, uh, we're not going to be able to do anything about this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But first of all, we say, you know, I'm making it up. This is really real. There are things that we can assess. There are things that we can support that will uh, basically help you because, if you're coming to me and have been told that you have this, uh, you may have been told there's really not much we can do. Uh, maybe we can give you uh, amitriptyline or you know some antidepressant because maybe it'll help you sleep better. Uh, but that's obviously not what the solution to any of this is. So we come up with a plan uh, to basically be able to manage this type of thing. 
So, you know, as I said, there's amitriptyline is, is a common one that I've seen people uh, do. And you say, well, what does it do? Well, it helps me sleep a little bit. Do you feel any different? Not really. So that's not what we're about. We're truly about trying to understand uh, which of the causes, and even if it's none of the ones I've already mentioned, are there other things that are underlying? Obviously, optimizing every organ, optimizing your nutritional status, optimizing especially your mineral status uh, is, is an important player. So, you know, in, this, in the conventional model, in addition to considering uh, pharmacological therapy, which is not what I do, but uh, some people are doing it and they do find obviously of some benefit. Uh, this cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is, which is basically is a talk session uh, and of course the alternative approaches and that's uh, what I'm gonna talk about. So uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is talk therapy. And what it attempts to do is, you know, it aims at solving problems uh, concerning this, this, these dysfunctional emotions, behaviors, uh, and, and tries to create a systematic aspect of, of making you realize it's not in your head. And the, and the fact that you, you have to somewhat believe that this is an issue and we need to be able to work through this. And in addition to uh, CBT, uh, also there's this uh, known as graded exercise therapy, which is basically trying to improve the physiologic response to doing some form of activity. Because the belief is that if we move our body, we'll be able to oxygenate uh, you know, our cells more efficiently and better, uh, and things will ultimately go a lot better. So the main goal is to first increase how long you can do activity, and then the second is to increase the activity. So the duration may start off being five minutes, which is not uh, overly uh, unusual. So th and this is not you know, where I wanna focus my attention because uh, it goes without saying. I t you know, in fact, not only people who have chronic fatigue, uh, but just in general, people who have fatigue, one of the most common things that we do is we take them off vigorous exercise routines because that in fact is interfering with their body's ability to get their multiple organ systems uh, back in balance. We let the, <clears throat> the individual choose uh, the time of exercise and doses to perform uh, because if they are allowed to choose it, there is the likelihood that uh, they will more likely continue. Personally, I always start with stretching, uh, the ability of stretching, and I also always start with walking. Uh, you know, walking at a pace and a distance that they're comfortable with, and because they don't know how long it is, I'll say, just get up from where you are, walk as far as you can in the next three minutes, turn around and come back six minutes or five minutes. How do you feel? How did you feel? Okay, I felt okay. Okay, well, walk one minute further. So don't plan on walking like three miles because you may not make it three miles. But so you go by time. You time it, then you turn around and you come back. So you get back home where you started in this, and you always start low <clears throat> so we don't get stranded uh, somewhere. There are definitely uh, common after effects, uh, you know, this post herpetic malaise, post exertion, I mean, that typically lasts uh, more than 24 hours. And what we unfortunately will get is if we overdo it, we get a worsening of their, of their symptoms. So the patient can't just work out and when they want to work out. Uh, they need to be certainly in this in the in the proper state. Uh, you know, the the uh, acute effects of the exercise is their uh, you know their slow heart rate acceleration as as they basically increase their workload. So once again, it's I always start simple. Try and move in the morning, try and stretch a little bit. Uh, if you have a good yoga instructor. Uh, don't overextend because people often want to do that. They want to stretch the body beyond its limits. You may start doing yoga by sitting in a chair as opposed to having to do uh, poses. And, you know, don't look online for poses that uh, Madonna can do because she's pretty amazing. She can pretty much bend her body in any direction you want it to go in. It's also not recommended that uh, there's very few medications that really do anything. Uh, the vigorous exercise is absolutely not recommended. Uh, it's not recommended that you try and nap three hours in the day to catch up, uh, and this this uh, activity rest schedule is not really recommended. 
so these have been published as being not particularly helpful or effective. I'm going to say that's not my personal experience. In fact, uh, everybody that I see almost with any type of fatigue, in my opinion, benefit from essential fatty acids in the form of fish oil or flax oil or borage oil, or even primrose oil, or hemp oil, etc. cetera. Uh, magnesium to me is potentially one of the most important minerals uh, you'll ever get, <clears throat> uh, you'll ever be able to utilize. Uh, you know, we see this bovine liver extract. The liver also is involved in this. Uh, B vitamins, folic acid, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are the types of things that, that I use. I don't use uh, prescriptions uh, for this type of thing. So uh, chronic fatigue is just defined by a variety of symptoms. It's really history that will give you the most information. It is perceived to be over three months of time that you certainly don't start to feel better. Uh, graded exercise is perceived to be one of the most important um, you know, treatments, but we're gonna go beyond that, obviously. It is important that one is patient uh, with whatever the treatment is uh, that they're gonna do. Uh, so, you know, I'm having said that, people also, oh my God, I'm in real trouble. It's doom and gloom, uh, but I'm here to say it's not doom and gloom. Uh, because the reality is we haven't yet uh, sort of approached it from the biological medicine approach. <coughs> and what's that? So for to, first of all, we have to uh, create an understanding as to, you know, what is biological medicine and how is biological medicine different from, you know, any other type of medicine uh, that basically exists. So the, the first aspect is, is to create an understanding of what happens when our body is in balance. And what I have there is what we call normal health function. I just listed four different organ systems, the, the digestion, immune, circulation, and hormones. Now, we know that on an everyday basis, just by circulating in life, uh, we basically are exter exposed to something external to us. It's not just about what's going on in our inside. It's what's going on in our outside. And these uh, factors may be a physical thing, it may be too hot, it may be too cold, it may be a huge uh, mental aspect of things. You hear some bad news, uh, you know, directly or social media or whatever, or it can be a chemical. We talk about pesticides and chemicals, et cetera. So you are exposed on an everyday basis, on a, you know, to tens of thousands of things that are not you, meaning they're not part of you, that are foreign to you. And over the uh, 500,000 years that we've been on the planet, there has been an adaptation that has allowed us to survive and get to this particular point. So when what the body has learned is that when you are exposed to something foreign to you, uh, something has to happen. And that something has to be a reaction. Uh, and that reaction is what creates a symptom. Uh, and the whole idea of the symptom is to tell you to stop something, to change something, to do something. And so when we get that reaction, what the ideal is, is that we get a discharge or we get the typical inflammation. We have pain, we have swelling, we have redness. Maybe you get a discharge, or you, maybe you get a runny nose, maybe you start coughing, maybe you get diarrhea, maybe you get a skin rash, et cetera. <clears throat> and that's what's supposed to happen. That's the way the 500,000 years we've been on the planet, it has been set up so that we can survive. But we say, but what does medicine do? It says, well, I gotta go to work tomorrow. I got this runny nose. I don't wanna have my, you know, this, all this discharge when I'm at work, uh, or I can't send my child to daycare, my grandchild to daycare, or I can't send my child to school because they're gonna infect everybody else. So what do we do? Let's dry it up. Let's stop the discharge. Let's take some Sudafed. Let's use some Nasonex and dry up the spray. And unfortunately, what that does, it doesn't allow us to return to normal healthy function. Because if you stop a normal natural law, you're somewhere along the line, it's gonna have to break down. This is what's supposed to happen. This is the normal biological process in balance. So if you have a headache and take a Tylenol and say, oh, my headache went away, and I'll say, well, where did it go? I don't know where it went. 
the, the only reason it would have went away if you took a Tylenol is the assumption that you must have had a Tylenol deficiency. And if you don't have a Tylenol deficiency, then the headache isn't gone. It's still there. You just haven't figured out the reason. Maybe you need your neck adjusted. Maybe you're dehydrated. Maybe you didn't sleep well. Maybe you slept properly. Uh, maybe you're overly tired. Maybe you ate a food allergen. And by just taking a medication, you don't deal with any of the real problems. And unless we do, we're never going to stay in this particular picture. So we always say that because you don't have symptoms, people say I'm healthy. Now that doesn't really mean anything. Normal definitely does not mean healthy. The goal is ultimately to produce optimal health. So how does that change when we're looking at somebody who has a chronic illness process? And you can apply any name to it you want. Uh, from heart disease to autoimmune disease to Lyme disease to chronic fatigue, it's kind of irrelevant. So when we go through those stages, what now happens, depending on when this, when this intervention starts or stops, the reaction that happens, the discharge, uh, the rash, uh, the diarrhea, the stomach upset, the nausea, uh, whatever it is, is not um, effective enough or we stop it from being effective enough um, you know, for, for what's, what's happening. <clears throat> and so as a result of that, the, there becomes an imbalance uh, within our body uh, you know, that normally is happening. And the body is, over time, is unable to restore the body to balance. And unfortunately, at that point, we're now into what we call the chronic uh, disease process which is not what we want uh, ultimately to happen because chronic, a, what a chronic condition means is, is that, uh, oops, I'm sorry, uh, we, need to, um, we need to have some form of intervention in order for the body to get better. And there we have this chronic problem uh, that the, the body can't solve on its own. And so when we have this unhealthy state, when we have this disease process, the the body the cells start to degenerate they start to lose function they're not capable of doing everything that they normally should have done uh, as they would have earlier on in this uh, in this process and then of course we end up ultimately with uh, this whole idea that they have a chronic illness so when we say uh, biologized uh, what we do is we go through these seven steps in order to reverse this whole process. So biological medicine, bioregulatory medicine, of course, has to first analyze what's going on, ident help you identify what it is, and then educate you to what the process is. Uh, then we have to go through, you know, using a variety of therapies that allows you to, the body to detoxify and to support the growth of new cells. And then eventually that will allow the body to adapt to its present situation it allows it to re-regulate its present situation and then to regenerate uh, what's, what's going on. When we get into that, we get into what we call cure. Uh, just, having, uh, just not having a symptom uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're cured of something. Uh, you know, taking a Tylenol for a headache doesn't mean that a headache is cured. <clears throat> it simply means you don't feel it anymore. Cure means you would never have to need a Tylenol again. Uh, or whatever it is that you're doing. It's, and it's creating the understanding. So this is where the whole approach leads to optimal health, uh, which is ultimately what we're about. And that's why it doesn't matter what we start with, whether we start with somebody with stage four cancer uh, or somebody who has a hangnail or the, the uh, five-year-old who is having asthma or eczema or whatever is going on. You know, it doesn't matter when we st when we start the intervention. Uh, we just need to do something. So it's very common that we have multiple organ systems that are out of balance that need the support. Obviously, from the presentation of what chronic fatigue is, <coughs> there's multiple organ systems. I would say you could have ten organ systems that are out of balance. And eventually, yes, we need to support that. We need to help you feel better in order to, for you to be encouraged to keep moving forward. But the real cure for the underlying problem isn't going to be just treating your symptoms. Uh, isn't just, well, you can take this, you know, in order to sleep, you can take a sleep aid uh, or you can, for your mood stuff, you can take an antidepressant, whatever. 
those may be supportive, but they're not going to be curative of, of the underlying uh, problem. So it's much more than just trying to simply address uh, signs and symptoms uh, where people are at. What we're really looking for, and what's interesting about blood tests, um, as I suspect at some point many of you, of course, we've all had a lab tests. We go to our doctor for an annual exam, and he says everything's normal. Well, you know, it's, when, it, when you look at blood tests, it's very interesting because the what normal is considered by normal meaning a reference range. You see, 95% of everybody who got a blood test, it's normal before you even get the test. Only the bottom two and a half percent, the top two and a half percent, are are perceived to be out of reference range. That is not what we're talking about. We want it in a much smaller range to really produce what we know as optimal functioning. We're not into normal, we're into optimal, and how do how are we able to achieve that? So these are common uh, blood tests that are done. <coughs> Everybody has worries about their their cholesterol, which is probably the least thing you should be worried about because the reality is 80% of your cholesterol is made by your liver. And somebody says, oh, your cholesterol is high. Let's lower your cholesterol. Nobody says, well, what's my liver doing? How come my liver is making so much cholesterol? Well, no, you shouldn't eat eggs. You shouldn't eat red meat. That's not what's raising your cholesterol to 220 or 250 or 300 or even 180 or whatever it is your doctor feels is high. You need What you need to say is, if you want me to take a statin drug, why is my liver making so much cholesterol? And the answer is, well, it doesn't matter. We don't know. Let's just lower your cholesterol with the assumption that somehow that's going to lower your risk for a cardiovascular accident. The research shows that it actually doesn't, even though I've had one doctor tell me we should put it in the water uh, because everybody should take it. And all we do is basically have a lot of drugs in the water. And, you know, I lived in Portland for 25 years, 26 years. And there was an analysis done of three of the rivers around the Portland area of what's in the water. It was full of statin drugs. It was full of birth control pills. It was full of antidepressants because they just get peed out. Uh, and they're unfortunately not necessarily doing it. It was full of hormones. And then, of course, we want to eat the fish. And we wonder why the fish are so affected is because they're, they're living in this water that's full of all these medications that people are basically taking. And so it's a vicious uh, cycle. So we're not really about the symptom uh, model. Uh, because unfortunately, the symptom model, especially for this problem, uh, is not really going to be that particularly helpful because it's neither efficient nor adequate in the vast majority of cases. So what do we do from uh, the approach that we're looking at? I mentioned that we look at a whole body system. And this is just an example of uh, many of our several, not all our organ systems. And, you know, if, if you've ever heard me speak before, you may have heard me say, I truly believe that the specialization in medicine has overall lowered our general health uh, of our nation. And the reason is, is that, you know, if you have a headache and go to the neurologist, you know, they'll try and say, well, you don't have this, you don't have that, here, take this medication. When the reality is the headache may be coming from your digestive system, the neurologist isn't looking at that. And you're not going to the, to the gastroenterologist because you don't think anything's wrong. Uh, or you don't, you may not realize that uh, problems, you know, in your musculoskeletal system are really coming from your respiratory system. So we end up going to the wrong specialist. And in the case of chronic fatigue, for example, you'd have to probably go, go to every single one of those doctors to get their opinion. And they'll say, well, in my area, yeah, you have this, do this. So all you'd end up with is a, is a handful of different uh, medications trying to treat a symptom but nobody is really looking at the whole. That's really what stands biological medicine out. And the one system you can't go to for a specialist is the lymphatic system. There is no lymphologist that exists. There's no specialty. And yet it is potentially one of the most important systems to treat for anybody with fatigue of any type, whether it's chronic fatigue uh, or whether it's fatigue from an autoimmune disease or fatigue from a flu or you know adrenal type problems. Uh, this is the type of problems that uh, really we need to be looking at that's underlying uh, the specific issue. And, you know, we'll get into, uh, you know, potentially in future webinars what we're going to do about that. In addition to that, in our clinic, 
because of what I've talked about, uh, we, there's a whole bunch of additional tests that we have potentially access to. Uh, you know, for looking more specifically your digestive system, we can do a, a stool analysis, we can do a saliva and urine test, we can do food sensitivity tests, a micronutrient test. They said over 75% of the U.S. population is missing at least one, one nutrient. Bioimpedance, heart rate variability, et cetera, et cetera. You get an idea that uh, this is not all gloom and doom. Uh, this is not, there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, in fact, I had a, a young woman today with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. When I went over these tests with her, she just looked at it and said, wow, there really is some things out of balance. I said, absolutely. We can look at you know, how, how your body is composed. Uh, we know that for the most part, our body is made up, the greatest percentage of us is water. Uh, women should be in the area arena of 52 to 55%. Men should be in the area of 55 to 60 percent, and I'll virtually guarantee every person who has one of these issues, that's not going to be the scenario. They're going to be in a state technically of cellular dehydration, even though they say, "But I drink a lot. I drink, you know, two quarts or three quarts of water a day, and this and that." But then they'll say, "But I just pee it right out." A sign that we have a mineral a type problem. You know, this is a some of the simple statistics and you know the the, the last point that I want to make here is the on this particular is to read the, the what's on the bottom of this slide the percentage of water depends on your hydration level and people who feel thirsty uh, are already two to three percent dehydrated so if you say I'm never feeling thirsty that doesn't mean you're not dehydrated if you are thirsty you're already three percent dehydrated but it only takes 1% dehydration uh, to basically affect mental performance and physical coordination before, and that's long before anybody says that they're thirsty. So don't rely on thirst as being an indicator I should drink water. So when you're out in the summer or playing a sport or you know doing some type of activity and saying, oh yeah, I did this, I'm thirsty, it's because you lost a whole bunch of water, now you're needing to rehydrate and Obviously, the reason that, I mean, even in professional sports, you see people using, you know, they're constantly rehydrating because their performance goes down as they dehydrate. So, you know, the, the uh, athletes and they, uh, you know, realize that I need to keep this level of hydration up. In fact, in some of the professional sports, you know, in, the, in midway through the game for sport, they'll actually get an IV therapy because they become so dehydrated. It is such a critical aspect and it's so common and most people don't realize that if you have an issue, that's probably one of the very first things that we need to do. This is just a, a you know, graph of a, of a, that we would look at with uh, uh, your body composition. Uh, we obviously have to look at your nervous system. We know that the nervous system is divided up into a sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic being the flight or fright, parasympathetic being the rest and relax. And now we can we do a little test, and the vast majority of people, like the uh, young lady I saw today, basically they live over here on the right side, which is the sympathetic dominant side, never getting out of it because there's false energy. So the nervous system is trying to protect things. And of course, when you're in this particular state, if you look down near the bottom, it says, what is the component when you live in this sympathetic state? Is that you inhibit your stomach, pancreas, and intestines. You inhibit urination. Uh, so in other words, you eat food, organic food, all perfect, you know, no gluten, no dairy, no sugar. And you say, why don't I feel better? I'm doing such a good job with this diet. It's because when you're sympathetic dominance, you can't digest it and you end up fermenting it, which means you're not getting the minerals in efficiently uh, as you would otherwise. So there's this tremendous balance that we need to be mindful of. Uh, and then we, on the bottom of this um, uh, little picture here, we see these two triangles. If you can see them, one is the sympathetic and one is the parasympathetic. What we have to do with anybody with fatigue or any type of problem is to rebalance those. Those are a big overliers of why a lot of our challenges or the body is breaking down, but we need to support that. Uh, we can check your cardiovascular system without being too worried about your uh, what is your lipid levels? Although that's a component, we obviously concern about it. We can look at how much tension uh, there is within your cardiovascular system. 
and we can potentially predict 20 years before it happens whether or not you're going to be more susceptible to some form of a cardiovascular accident long before anybody is looking at CRP, uh, fibrinogen, homocysteine levels, etc. So these types of functional tests uh, give us a lot more information, just as contact regulation thermography done, where we use 119 points on the skin uh, to measure 15 different organ systems to look and see how your body is responding to stress. And stress, you can uh, you can put in whatever you perceive to be stress. Do remember that the body doesn't know good stress from bad stress. If stress is something that the body has to respond to in some form. And uh, Dr. Salier from uh, McGill University in Montreal back in the 30s when he came out with this whole concept of the stress response, uh, realized that if you went to a wedding on four consecutive weekends, and measured your numbers, and then the four next weekends went to four funerals and measured your numbers, they wouldn't be any different. They look exactly the same. So whether it's happy stress or sad stress, physiologically the body responds. So you can't get away from stress. In fact, you don't want to get away from stress. And one of the topics we'll eventually talk about is stress, and stress is not necessarily all bad for you. But we can use this a type of an evaluation to get a report tells us which organ systems are, you know, are supposedly a healthy patient saying, I don't have any, I just want to do it because where am I? But we can certainly get lots of information. We can also get some additional information from doing uh, this energetic scan uh, of your body uh, that's based on uh, quantum physics, uh, as well as the frequency, uh, frequency, um, you know, waves from your body gives us information we get a graph like this and we see that there's a whole number of different types of organs that uh, potentially are out of balance and, and not particularly beneficial. Uh, for some people, neurofeedback uh, will become a very valuable tool and we can use neurofeedback to create a brain scan, uh, which is shown in that picture. And from that, we can design a program specifically to try and get the, the left and right side of the brain rebalancing each other talking to each other so you know it's not one is doing this and one is doing this and nobody ever talks to each other uh, so we can get some good information uh, out of that particular approach so that said the function tonight is not to say okay how many how many dozen things will you do so the most important thing is the assessment is to be able to properly assess where is your body at where are your organ systems at uh, you know looking at the types of things that we can do and down this list of what 25 things there these are the types of of uh, therapies that once we've made our diagnostic criteria and once again we don't really care if you have a have a diagnosis of chronic fatigue or fatigue or or autoimmune disease we do the same type of diagnostics find the organ systems that are out of balance and then we will apply uh, a specific type of therapy that is the most appropriate to your situation. So this is not one size fits all. And you see along the bottom of that particular slide, um, we see a different, a whole bunch of different organs, respiratory, cardiovascular, uh, digestive, lymph, endocrine, nervous, musculoskeletal, skin, reproductive, urinary, immune. And you see that some therapies are not effective for those particular systems. So that's how we can customize your specific treatment um, to you know to the specifics of uh, what's going on here. So, so um, never give up. There's a lot of great things uh, that are going to take place in time. Uh, we do believe that we have great tools. Uh, we do believe that uh, you know we have more information that we're going to be sharing with you in in a month from uh, from now on uh, Tuesday, April the 24th. Uh, the next webinar and you'll be uh, getting an email uh, invite for that type of thing um, and from that aspect next time we're going to be talking about the endocrine system uh, which is not about just chronic fatigue which is that we hinted at here today but it's any type of fatigue and once again along with pain fatigue and pain are probably the two most common reasons uh, that people will uh, will present to a doctor <clears throat> And in addition, uh, for those of you who are in the uh, Cape Cod area or the Providence, Rhode Island area, I'm going to be physically there and doing a, a, a presentation uh, those evenings on the 11th in Cape Cod, on the 12th of April in Providence. 
that you're invited to come to. And that presentation is going to be on uh, the 10 natural laws and how the 10 natural laws play a role in your specific situation uh, as to you know how can you take where you're at today, leave that particular presentation and say, I can start to institute this, this, and this in a way to start getting my uh, organ systems back into balance and not to be outdone by uh, more education. Uh, you can join us at the uh, second Biological uh, Regulatory Medicine Institute Conference, which will be in Louisville, Kentucky, on May the 10th and 12th. Uh, if you go to the website brmi.online, uh, you'll get information about that particular uh, seminar and uh, weekend. It's a Thursday night and Friday, Saturday. Uh, there's a number of different presenters, including myself, uh, medical doctors, chiropractors, dentists. You know, this whole idea of of how do we look at the body as a whole and not sort of go to these individual specialists uh, that you know we've been talking about. So um, if any of you who have been listening are saying, oh gee, man, maybe there's something that was offered this evening uh, that you know that that would benefit me, you can actually call the number there. And you can call Ashley in our clinic uh, here in Scottsdale. Instead of a time to chat to to see you know what types of things may be the most beneficial for your specific situation, uh, we can go from there. <clears throat> and then uh, as we've been going along, there are some questions that have come up, so I'm gonna try and ask answer some of those questions. Uh, so the quick version says, how does uh, the endocarbonoid system interact with all of this? Uh, the reality is is that every system interacts with every other system. And you know what we try to do when we look at the whole is not to say, oh, we have to we have to focus our energy over here, we have to focus our energy over there. I what I look at mostly is physiology. And I try and understand why the physiology is not working efficiently. And there is a many of the things I just shared tonight. Um, you know, maybe you can't handle your stress. So until we know uh, what your hormones are doing, what your nervous system is doing, what your cardiovascular system is doing, what your digestive system is doing, what your immune system is doing, digestive, et cetera, et cetera, I don't worry about the individual parts of the, of the puzzle. Obviously, everything ties into everything. The brain is the master. Um, if I go back to uh, the slide, this slide, you know, if we look at all those different organs that are down the left-hand side of that page, we see that there's some greens and there's some, you know, orange, yellows, and reds. The ideal scan would be green to just a little bit shy of that line that goes down there. In other words, every organ is doing their part. Every organ is in balance. And what is directing this? What's directing this is your nervous system. Uh, so, you know, I, I, the analogy I uh, give to the patients in the, in the office is saying, imagine that every one of those organs uh, is a musical instrument. The brain is the master conductor, <clears throat> and the, they're tuning up for some big symphony at Carnegie Hall. And the, the, uh, the conductor, the orchestra leader, is looking around and saying, oh, my gosh, they must have all the wrong sheets of music because nobody's playing the same tune. So the nervous system is sending information down to all these organs, knowing that something isn't working right. The job of the nervous system is to protect our environment. It's to allow us to be able to survive. And when you have this many organ systems out of balance, you can't just pick one and say, what does this do? What does that do? How does that do? So, uh, you know, how does it tie in? Everything ties in. Uh, so, you know, I, I hope that's adequate enough as far as an answer is concerned. Uh, but I, because we individualize every treatment, uh, you know, is it important? You know, medicine, what I found is, is when you try and dissect it down to what I call a Newtonian physics, you know, the whole idea of Isaac Newton, who basically is the father of physics, and that's what medicine tries to do. They think we can dissect now that we can get down to the genes. We can dissect it right down to the level of the genes. One day we'll be able to say, oh, you need this gene. We're going to take that gene out. We'll plug it in just like if your hard drive collapses, you know, that we'll take the hard drive out and put a new one in. The body doesn't work like that. And it never will. It never has. And it can't as body as goes on because 
everything is interactive. There's so little we really know about how the body works. We think we know all this stuff. We virtually know nothing. Uh, you know, the, the old adage used to be if uh, the Empire State Building was all the things that go on, if we were to stand beside the Empire State Building and place a dime on the sidewalk, that's about how much we know versus how relatively how much there is to know. So we're just fooling ourselves if we think we can manipulate, you know, a few biochemical terms without looking at the whole. That's why I really think biological medicine is really the only medicine that really makes sense. Because if we're only looking at one part of the puzzle, we're never going to be able to, to uh, get the whole uh, in order to truly allow you to get into balance. And, you know, once we've identified those systems that are out of balance, it then becomes much more logical and evident to start to introduce specific components that will be more supportive. And we always have to decide where do we start. We start what we call the five primary monk trees, and that will be the subject of another, another meeting and another discussion. So I'm going to go back up, and I'm going to have to click on this. Unless uh, there's a long question there. So let's see here. Uh, CBD includes uh, learning to reframe. Yeah, there's lots of ways to reframe things. I personally, what my preference is, medic, um, therapy wise, is homeopathy. Uh, homeopathic remedies, a variety of different types of energetic. Uh, I do not believe that somebody can take a physical substance that has an energy associated with it personally, uh, because all disease starts energetically long before there's any physical substance, long before there's any, any uh, an, an ability to understand that there's an imbalance going on uh, in, in the region or in the area. So my preference to getting energy things back in balance, is, and hands-on will do it. Some people will do it with cranial sacral uh, is another way of getting sort of that type of thing. And, you know, whether it's uh, CBD, learning to reframe things and, you know, biochemically trying to change things. It's like, yeah, there's an energy there, but I will always go to the, the top of, the, of the, the pyramid, we say, and the top of the pyramid is always going to be energetic. And when you have an energetic substance, you technically don't have physical matter. You have only the energy of that matter. So perhaps, and I don't know if somebody, somebody probably has, uh, somebody basically has potentized, uh, you know, CBT oil. I don't know what the proving would be, uh, but, you know, I'm personally more inclined to look at that as opposed to think we're going to just modify somebody's biochemistry by using, I'm going to say, mind-altering medications. If you look at, you know, what does an antidepressant do? Does it really improve depression? People feel better, but what happens when they stop? Uh, is it cured? You know, the same, the same underlying issues are there, and I truly believe that's because we haven't really looked at what is the root of the issue. Without going into too much, the root of the issue, I said sort of tongue in cheek <coughs> to start, if you didn't choose your grandparents, great grandparents, and parents well, energetically, we're already behind the eight ball. It is known in animal studies and in human studies that chronic disease starts at least one generation before our conception. And that's why we have to use energetic therapies in order to truly get past that. At least in my personal clinical experience, uh, that's what I need to do. So that's a long-winded answer. I hope it was sufficient to uh, what it is that uh, ultimately you're looking for here. Um, now, is there any other questions? So, is there any other questions that have come in um, here? I'll do PDF. Oh, here we go. Uh, do drenching night sweats figure into the complex picture? Uh, what else to ask the patient if they experience these? Well, drenching night sweats, uh, you know, you say, you know, who most often experiences drenching night sweats? For the most part, the most common is postmenopausal women as we're going through this uh, perimenopause menopause phase. And, you know, there's several theories as to what it is. Is it the fact that your hormones, your estrogen, progesterone, are no longer sufficient to give a feedback loop up to the brain? to luteinizing hormone and FSH hormone. And then the body is trying to stimulate that. <clears throat> and so we have this imbalance of estrogen and progesterone that then during the night creates this sweat because during the night, of course, our bodies are cooling down. Uh, our bodies are typically one to two degrees colder at night 
It's just natural physiology. Is why I don't believe checking your 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 morning temperature is a very good indicator of um, of whether you have thyroid disease or not. There's a whole other reason why that's not a good time to check your basal body temperature. If you want to check your basal body temperature, you should check it about half an hour before your typical noon meal. That's going to give you a much more uh, clinical indication as to truly what that temperature is. Uh, so how do they figure into this complex picture? Uh, you know, the most obvious is, is that you're going to have a lymphatic problem because you're going to have congestion. You're definitely going to have a, a hormone imbalance issue, and that's going to be the subject of our next the presentation in a month from now. Uh, that's how it'll eventually tie in. And of course, if you have those problems, I can guarantee that you have a mineral problem, which means you have a digestive problem. Uh, so, and maybe you have an immune system problem. And what's interesting, looking at drenching night sweats, there's also this uh, dysautonomia, which is an imbalance from the nervous system. That's another system that ties into this, where you know this uh, the um, autonomic response from the nervous system it, it it's so confused. You know, just like that slide on the uh, just showed this one, the imbalance that exists when you have something that that many organs that are out of balance. And the nervous system is trying to figure out who the problem is, it'll give you a variety of signs and symptoms. So we say, well, what do we do about the symptom? Do we go and take a shower? Do we change the sheets? Yeah. Do we change our night clothes? Yeah, that's the temporary solution. But the real solution is to try and find how many of these organ systems are out of balance. There isn't any symptom that any patient has ever seen in the five decades I've been a doctor that I can't relate to multiple organ systems uh, that are out of balance. So there's always gonna be that underlying, there's always gonna be that uh, there that will be a, a particular uh, issue or a problem uh, for what's going on. So hopefully that uh, gives some sense of that. <clears throat> will there be a PDF available of your slides? Uh, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, the I, I'll have a discussion with uh, with our organizers to sort of see what would be the best way uh, of that happening. Uh, you know, the whole thing with slides without the you know what it is that I'm talking about. There are, there are a bunch of pictures, hopefully informative pictures uh, that are that is helpful. Uh, you know, the what we wanted people to get into is hopefully telling other people that the things exist. That you know there is another way of uh, supporting uh, management uh, for people. Uh, generally that, that will be helpful. So we'll get back to you on that. Uh, it's still relying on drainage as a cornerstone of treatment in general. Uh, unfortunately, drainage is a cornerstone of everything. Drainage is a natural law. Uh, you know, drainage, what drainage simply means um, is getting the, the systems in your body that that's those three or four slides that I showed you about a biological medicine or bioregulatory medicine, the reality is it's more or less the same thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a different fancy term. Biological means we're getting, we're, we're understanding the physiology and the biology of the body so that it basically is working in a very efficient and effective manner. That's, that's really what this is all about. <laughs> um, how does biological bioregulatory medicine uh, differ from functional medicine approach in treating chronic fatigue? It's a great question. Um, people who go to practitioners who have studied uh, functional medicine, you know, my uh, aspect of functional medicine is functional medicine do a lot of testing. In fact, thousands and thousands of dollars of testing. In fact, you could probably spend $20,000 on testing. And then instead of, uh, this is my personal experience, and if anybody out there is, feels differently, then uh, I apologize. Uh, my experience of my patient population who've gone to a doctor who does functional medicine, what they then end up with is a laundry list of things that says, well, this is low, so take this. This is high, so we got to lower that down. In order to improve this, you need to take this. So they end up with basically a whole suitcase full of different types of remedies, specifically trying to treat a lab test. But they're not treating the patient because they're not asking, but if this is low and that's high, why is it low and why is it high? So they're more interested in the lab test result than they are in understanding what is the functional aspect that's underlying the problem. 
the actually not use the wrong word the biological aspect that's underlying the problem um, the aspect of of um, you know using what it is that we're trying to do in biological medicine is to support a process the remedies that we do the nutraceuticals that we do the herbal medicines that we do the homeopathics that we do or hands-on therapies whatever it is uh, you know be it a hands-on type of an energy therapy or you know you take drops under your tongue or pellets are basically the uh, the aspect of uh, supporting the body's natural laws five primary among trees and when those start to work it is pretty amazing how much better people start to feel without saying let's worry about all these things that are high and low I have to admit that 20 30 years ago when sort of functional medicine was like oh this is interesting you know one of the first ones that came out are the whole idea of amino acids let's test all your amino acids and then we'll then you you know in those days we there was a company that would compound the amino acids then a month later they say we'll test them again you test them again and they're all different and of course they're all different they're different every day they're fact different probably five times a day so the moment that you test them isn't like it's a static and it never changes it's you know depending on what you ate for breakfast yesterday and dinner last night and what you're going to eat tomorrow night are going to change your amino acid profile on some level so we can't you know unless we're constantly have some way of having a catheter in and are constantly monitoring things just like somebody who has um, diabetes and has a pump and, they, and they're constantly being monitored you know unless we have that there's no possible way we can know exactly the types of things we do so we look at it from biological more so than functional aspect and using I would say more energetic approach than a nutraceutical approach um, I'm, I'm always a believer that just giving people a ton of vitamins will never make will never cure the disease may make them feel better but you're gonna have to use the energetic therapies because that is where and is always going to be the root of the problem no matter what the root of the problem is <clears throat> Uh, can you send out a list of devices that you use to assess and monitor your patients? Uh, I'll list them. Uh, the most common things we do initially, we do the standard tests, but we're not looking for normal, so we, we do a standard blood test, just like your doctor does, but our reference range, instead of being this, you know, the standard is this wide, it's this wide, because we're looking at optimals. So many times people will say, my doctor said the normals are all normal, and I'll say, the reference range, they're not optimal, and when they're not optimal, we have a way now to integrate that. So that's our first step, uh, what we do. And if somebody's had x-rays or MRIs or CTs or whatever, we look at those too. Uh, then in our office, we do an in-body or a body composition analysis. It gives you that one report that I showed you. Uh, we do heart rate variability. Uh, we do digital pulse analysis. Uh, we do a zytoscan of foods, organs, microbes to start to see the types of things that uh, people may be involved with uh, we do contact regulation thermography uh, the graph that i showed you that looks at 119 points uh, looks at 15 different organ systems uh, we do magnetic resonance therapy uh, to, which is like a form of chinese cupping except we're using it sort of electronically uh, with a suction uh, that we can move over your spine and along your ribs to see uh, the the uh, the um, response as far as how much your lymphatics are congested when we take all that information and put it together what i you know the way i like to refer to it is is it's like we're gathering information as if each of the each of the bits of information is a piece of a jigsaw puzzle and if we're only looking at one piece of a jigsaw puzzle you go to one specialist and they look at one piece how do you know what the whole picture looks like it's impossible so we get as many pieces of the puzzle as we can and I think doing it that way we have a much more we have a greater likelihood that we'll be able to create this understanding of you know what the particular problem is and then my own personal bias that I don't think is emphasized anywhere near enough in medicine certainly not emphasized enough in uh, you know even naturopathic medicine or even biological medicine uh, by some practitioners is the influence of childhood and teen years on somebody who is coming to us at 
no matter what age it is. And the reason for that is, if any of you haven't read um, Bruce, I shouldn't say Bruce Six, not Bruce Six, Bruce Lipton uh, books on uh, the biology of belief, and if you that will change your whole thinking of how our body works. Uh, but anyway, the aspect of you know that component is this idea that what we were exposed to, literally from preconception, through conception, through pregnancy, through those first. 25 years create what we call learned perceptions and every time we have a response to something we nearly always go back to what those learned perceptions were when were the learned perceptions the most influential is all those formative years and our brain doesn't fully myelinize till well into our 20s which means those learned perceptions will last easily until that age so how we react how we respond to different situations how we respond to ultimately what's happening will be literally determined by those learned perceptions. And that aspect, I don't think we pay enough heed to when we're looking at ultimately creating a cure for fibromyalgia, for chronic fatigue, for stage four cancer, or you know autoimmune disease, or a hangnail, or dysmenorrhea. It doesn't matter really what it is because we don't. I don't feel I treat diseases, never have. Don't believe that that's really where my expertise is. I really believe I'm a health practitioner, not a disease practitioner, uh, to ultimately make uh, this, you know, what it needs to be. Um, all right, I think we're certainly at our time limit. <laughs> Appreciate you people for hanging out there. Um, it would be greatly appreciated if you could, in any way, give us any feedback uh, on this, on topics that you're interested in, uh, areas of expertise. I said we're going to be doing this every month. Next month is April the 24th. I think in May, it's May the 22nd. It's the fourth Tuesday of the month. This will be the timing of doing it in the evening if you're in the East and the late afternoon if, like me, in the West, uh, generally speaking. Uh, we would like this to be a two-way street as educational as possible uh, for people because I believe that the more you know, uh, the more you'll be able to share your answer, your questions uh, with your physician. Uh, and if you are really looking for the biological approach, uh, obviously right now Scottsdale is the place to go. And within a few months, you're going to have those in the East. You're going to have the option of, of attending the clinic in Providence, Rhode Island, which will be a, you know, a great opportunity <laughs> for people to uh, have exposure to this type of medicine and truly get a, a real root and true understanding of uh, what's going on for people. So that said, uh, thank you for signing on. Uh, I think uh, Heidi will probably sign us off uh, by basically discontinuing this, uh, and she didn't put in post any more questions. So I'm assuming for tonight uh, that's going to be it. Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, once again, I really would appreciate your feedback and any other topics. And uh, until next month, uh, tell other people about this. And this, oh by the way, uh, this recording will be posted on the uh, brmmi.online website uh, so go there and you know it'll probably be a bit of time but uh, within a, a few days a week perhaps uh, you'll find it posted and uh, send uh, any of colleagues any people who are interested in looking at this type of medicine to the website and future events there'll be a place on the website where all these will be posted there'll be a link uh, for you to be able to uh, to listen to it again in the future and once again if you've uh, heard it this evening I always encourage people to do it again because uh, I learned from my mentor that you have to hear things about seven times before you really take it in and really start to appreciate and understand uh, what's ha happening. So let's call it an evening. Uh, in the East, it's I think it's 8:30. Uh, for me, it's uh, 5:30. So if you have a, we have lots of the evening left. Uh, go out and enjoy it. If you're in the West where I am, I'm gonna go outside because it's a beautiful sunny afternoon uh, still here. So have a good evening. Good evening, everybody. We'll chat again in uh, one month. Good talking to you all.